to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ by this time you ought to be teachers Yet you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12 following. We welcome you to our study of the book of Hebrews. Today's lesson we're going to be thinking about the encouragement the Hebrew writer gives Christians to mature, to grow, and to go on to perfection. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible, have it handy as we look to the Word of God together today. Our lesson is being brought to you by members of and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area, the Church of Christ, would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Look them up, find out their address and time of worship. They'd be happy for you to come by and visit with them on Sunday morning or Sunday night, Wednesday Bible study. You'll find people there who love God, who love the truth, and who are concerned about lost souls. If you'd like to study more, maybe find out a little more about the church. What is the, the Lord's church or the plan of salvation or worship? Friend, they'd be happy to sit down and speaking out of love, look to the Word of God on those issues. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Why don't you check out our website located at thegospelofchrist.com. Uh, from that, you can find all our study materials, whether it be audio lessons, videos, all of those are online. We've got transcripts, study questions, a wide variety of written Bible material, and the good news is it's all free. Available 24-7. Even if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, a hard copy, video or audio, we'll send that to you free of charge as well. Just visit our website, fill out a media request form, and we'll put that in the mail to you free of charge. Also, we want to encourage you to download the Gospel of Christ app, which is available for smartphones from both the Android and the Apple Store. That's free of charge also, and it's a great way to study the Word of God on the go. Today, we're kind of entering into the, the Hebrew writer is going to begin an argument and then rather have to stop abruptly to encourage people. So in Hebrews chapter 5, in about the first eight or nine verses, the Hebrew writer is going to begin to talk about Christ being greater than Aaron. We've seen Christ is greater than Moses in chapter 3. Christ is greater than Joshua in chapter 4, and now he's going to begin to talk about Christ being greater than Aaron, and by default, greater than the Levites and the Levitical system. And so he's going to throw out names like Melchizedek, and it's as though he can see the, the blank stare in these people's eyes. Mel who? What are you talking about there? And so he has to stop, and he has to challenge these Christians to not get stagnant, to not get in a rut, and to go on to perfection. And so we're going to pause today in the midst of this argument about the superiority of Christ and hopefully offer encouragement as well to make sure that we're growing and going forward as a Christian like we ought to. And then in our next lesson, we'll pick right back up with Christ being greater than Aaron, being greater than the Levites, and being according to the order of Melchizedek. And so in Hebrews chapter 5, the writer begins in verse 12, where that kind of parenthesis in the argument occurs all the way through chapter 6 to encourage them. Christians want to reach a point where they should be the teacher, not the student. And he says, basically, you've got that reversed. The problem is, some of these people may have been Christians for 5, 10, 20, maybe even 30 years, and yet they're not growing as they ought to. Look at the words of Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 12. The writer says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. 
I want you to think about it this way. Um, some of these Christians had a problem growing. They're not really growing like they ought to. And he's using the image here. He says, you ought to be teachers, but, and you ought to be on the meat of the Word, but you're on the milk of the Word. Can you imagine this? What if, what if you walked into an assembly and there was a 25 or 30 year old man sitting in the pew drinking milk out of a baby's bottle? What would you think about that fella? Well, I know what I'd think. I'd think something's probably not right there. Something, something might be wrong with that fella. Uh, something he may not have developed as he should have or something might be wrong with that individual. That's just not normal behavior to see that. Well, what about this? What if you saw a baby gnawing on a T-bone steak? Well, that's not right either. Babies drink milk. Mature people eat meat. And so the Hebrew writer is saying, you're that baby, uh, you, you ought to be eating the meat, but you're a baby who's still on the milk, although by this time you're big enough, you've grown enough, that there's no way you still ought to be on the milk of the Word. And so his encouragement is they need to reach a point where they become teachers. Christians cannot stay babes in Christ forever. There's no doubt a point where you're a babe in Christ. The Bible clearly teaches that, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 through 6 and other passages. But you can't stay a baby all your life. You can't be the one receiving the milk all your life. You've got to mature and grow and eventually reach a point where you can teach somebody, right? Mark 16 verse 15, Jesus said to His disciples, go into all the world, teach the gospel unto every creature. The older men are to teach the younger. The older women are to teach the younger women. The younger women are to teach the children. You just reach a point where you're not the one being taught. You're the one doing the teaching is the idea. And so I want you to think about as a Christian, where are you at in your growth? Where am I at in my growth? Could I teach someone about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Could I sit somebody down and say, hey, this is what the Bible says the church of the Lord's all about. Could I teach someone the plan of salvation. How long have you been a Christian? 10, 20, 30, 40 years maybe? Maybe more than that? Could you tell somebody, this is God's plan of salvation and this is what you need to do to be saved? Friend, if not, we might want to consider very seriously what Paul is saying here. Could I tell someone how to, what the Bible says about scriptural worship? How to worship God in spirit and in truth. Why we do the things we do on the first day of the week. Could I tell someone how to live for Christ each and every day? Those are very fundamental and elementary things of Christianity. And if I'm growing like I ought to, now I might have to get out my Bible and my concordance and write some passages down, but I could sit. Could we do that? Do we know why we do what we do? Have we learned and grown as we should as a Christian? If we can't do that, and friend, we may be a babe still in the faith. And that's something we need to grow out of. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3, uh, the church in Corinth was littered with problems. There's just a, a host of problems that occur. In fact, that's one of the main reasons 1 Corinthians was written to address all the problems. But they all stem from one problem. You're acting like babies in Christ. He would go on to say you're immature, you're bickering and you're fighting, and you're acting like babes in Christ when it ought not to be that way. The Bible says instead of being a babe in Christ, we ought to desire the pure milk of the Word that we can grow thereby. 1 Peter 2 verse 2. Uh, verse, uh, 2 Peter 3 verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We ought to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew chapter 5 verse number 6. And so this indicates to every child of God that we need to move on to the meat of the Word. We need to break up our fallow ground. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. We need to launch out into the deep. Let's get out of our comfort zone. Let's, uh, let's stop talking about and thinking about the things that are familiar and easy for us. And let's move on to areas that may be a little more challenging, but in so doing will help us to grow and can reach out to the lost just as well. And so Hebrews 5 Verses 12 through 14 is probably one of the strongest rebukes in the Bible. But these people needed it. And friend, we need to be motivated as well 
to, to go on to perfection and to not grow stagnant where we are as a Christian. Now, a threefold plan is given in Hebrews 5.14 of how they can actually... God doesn't just say, hey, you've acted like a baby and you need to quit that. God tells them, here's how you get over that. Here's what you can do to overcome this problem. God always gives the answer, doesn't He? Look at Hebrews chapter 5. A threefold plan is given. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, those who are mature, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How do you grow as a Christian? Well, friend, you make up your mind, I'm going to mature to full age. You make up your mind, I don't want to think like and act like and be a baby all my life. It's a decision that I make here, I'm going to grow. 1 Peter 2, 2, uh, as newborn babes, I'm going to desire the pure milk of the Word that I can grow by it. You don't drink milk all your life. You're not on the formula all your life. You've got to move on to other things that will be better nutrients and help you to grow. And so make up your mind to mature and to grow as a Christian. Secondly, if you want to grow, use what you have and what you know. Maybe you've heard it said, you never grow more than when you try to teach somebody else, when you're trying to put that into practice. Listen again to the words of Hebrews 5 verse 14. That is those who by reason of use, there's the idea. How do you grow? Use what you know every day. Use it to live the Christian life, no doubt. Use it to ward off sin. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119 verses 10 through 12. And use it to teach somebody else the gospel. Hey, I'm talking with somebody and they're having a problem. There are things in their life are not going like they really like for them to go. And they want to know what, what can I do. God can help you in that situation. Let me talk to you about what God would want us to do. Let me share with you what the Bible says. Let's sit down and open up the Scripture. And hey, I may have to go home first and study my Bible some more, grow in that area, but I guarantee you, in teaching them and in using that, I'm going to grow. And then, of course, the third way, make up your mind to mature, use what you know, and practice what you have to discern both good and evil. If I want to lift more weights, how would I do that? Let's say I could bench press a certain amount of weight. I don't know what that would be, but let's say I could bench press a certain amount of weight. How could I get to where I could bench press more weight? Exercise, putting more weight on there, straining against it, growing in that area. How do you grow as a Christian? By exercising your senses to discern both good and evil. You've got to take what you know and put it to use in your life by practicing what you preach by what, but not only just believing those things that we believe, but actually taking them out, putting in our life, and walking in the light, and using it every day, having the wisdom to know how to use that to bring honor and glory to Almighty God. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer will say, this requires us leaving behind some more elementary things and going on to greater things. What are those things? Notice Hebrews 6, the elementary things we're going to leave behind, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. And so basically he's saying, to, to, to get out of your comfort zone and to grow, you've got to stop staying in these elementary principles all the time. And he mentions son, repentance, faith, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection, eternal judgment. Hey, those are great pillars of the Christian faith. But if that's all I ever think about and talk about, those early fundamental principles that we learn, if I don't ever move on past that, I'm never going to grow. And so again, the basic idea is get out of your comfort zone. What do you know about X, whatever that may be. Some, some subject that I don't know a lot about. And I'd say, you know, I need, to, I need to study up on that. Somebody I work with has asked me about this and I don't have a clue about it. Well, get out your concordance, get out your Bible, study up on that. Move past just repentance and faith and resurrection and judgment and things like that. On to greater things is the idea. Let's go on to perfection is what the writer is trying to say in this context. And then, of course, the writer is going to tell us another reason. How can we go, what can we do 
to keep going forward and to go on to perfection and to grow as a Christian. Friend, a person living in sin, they can never ever mature and go on to perfection like they need to until they put that behind them. Sometimes people are not growing and maturing like they ought because there's some sin that's come back in their life that's keeping them from doing that. Notice Hebrews 6 beginning in verse number 4. The writer will say it's impossible for those who are once enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and of the powers of the age to come. Now listen to this. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Friend, this passage is not teaching that they can't repent, but it's impossible as long as they're in that mindset for them to repent. If I am steeped in sin, you know, sometimes people try to have the best of both worlds. We want to serve God and serve mammon at the same time. We want to have our cake and eat it too kind of idea. Someone's trying to live in sin and be a Christian. You can't do both. If someone becomes entangled again in sin, and that's a big part of their life, that person can't be brought to repentance until they decide, I'm going to put that sin behind me. Now, does the Bible teach that a person can repent? Absolutely. It's impossible while they're living in that state and have that mindset of living in sin and living it up for them to do that. But friend, it's not impossible to repent. You can at any point in time grow as a Christian, go on perfection if that person leaves sin behind. But to do that, you've got to make up your mind. I'm not going to live that way anymore. Acts 3 verse 19, I've got to repent and turn, turn from sin to God. Luke 3, verses 6 through 8, John would say to those in sin who want to be baptized just because everybody else was doing it but were living in sin, John would say, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Can people in sin turn back to God? Absolutely. But friend, to do that, you've got to give up sin. What keeps some people from going on to perfection and really growing and maturing as a Christian? Sadly, there are those who have some, for lack of a better word, pet sin in their life. They've got some sin that they're still holding on to that they just won't give up. Friend, I promise you, you will never mature. You will never go into perfection and you will not make it to that promised rest till you completely lay that aside. Listen to Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2. Seeing then that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the Hebrew writer says, listen to these words now. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Can you lay it aside? Can you give it up? Absolutely. Friend, you can't, tag, you, you can't have that pet sin tag along and everything be okay. I'm not, don't get me wrong. Am I saying that we're perfect? Am I saying that we'll never sin? Of course not. From time to time, we all make mistakes and we sin. But here's the difference. The person trying to walk in the light identifies that does his best to put that away, repents of it, turns from it. You can't keep doing it and keep walking in the light at the same time. We've got to do our best to put sin behind us and give that up and really live for Jesus Christ each and every day. Now, just like briars or weeds in the garden, there's a day coming for those who don't give it up and those who continue to live in sin. And God's going to punish them because of that. Look in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, But the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. Now watch this though. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected, near to being cursed, whose end is to be burnt. What in the world are we talking about with thorns and briars here? If a Christian's life, which ought to be free and pure of that, gets caught back up in it again. He's entangled in it again. 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22. Friend, that life, if it gets caught up in sin again, the briars and thorns and the bristles, all of that, it's not where it needs to be. And the Bible says that person eventually is going to be rejected. He's in danger of doing that. He's going to be cast out and internally burned. God doesn't want that. We don't want that. And so the Hebrew writer gives this warning, but I want you to listen next to the tenderness. This is the only time 
the only time in the book of Hebrews where we hear this tenderness is after one of the strongest rebukes in the Bible. Listen to Hebrews 6 verse 9. But beloved, he says, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, the things that accompany salvation. So he says, we speak in this manner. The writer says, I'm not afraid to warn you of this. I'm not afraid to tell you where you are. I'm not afraid to tell you to get off the milk, to get up and to get to growing again, to grow, don't grow snag, stagnant, that if you've got sin in your life, to get rid of it, or you're going to be lost. And he says, but I want you to know I'm telling you this because I love you and because we're confident you'll do better things. Friend, not only do you have one of the strongest rebukes, but you have one of the greatest, most endearing words of encouragement. You can do it. We love you. God loves you. Don't give up. You can do this. Hang in there to the end, he'll say. And God will help us in that. And so in Hebrews chapter 6, we find great encouragement to live for God each and every day and the, the hope and encouragement that one day we can be with God for all eternity. Now, there's a couple of things in this passage that also offer us hope. Hebrews 6 verse 18, we have God as our hope. Look in Hebrews 6 verse 18, the Bible says that by two immutable things, unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. As the writer talks about their, their hope, which he's confident they'll remain in, he says, here's what you can know. God is at the center of that. And what's great about God? God, who cannot lie, has given us the promise. Friend, I can, God's going to be with me no matter what. And Malachi 3, 6 says God's not going to change. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. And so as we strive to grow and to mature and to do what God wants us to, whether it be to put off sin or to learn more, friend, God's promised He'll help. God's not going to lie. Here's what the Bible says. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Uh, be content with such things as you have, the writer says. Don't let covenants be a part of your heart. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For He Himself has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? God's not going to lie. He's promised to help you. He's promised you can do it. He's given you the best guide ever. Uh, you can do it. Hang in there, he says. And then, of course, we have this help also. Our hope is our anchor in troubled water. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, and I want you to listen to verse number 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever. And then he picks back up with the argument, according to the order of Melchizedek. Friend, what, what encouragement do we have to go on to perfection, to, to don't stay a babe in Christ, but to mature, to, to lay aside sin, to keep pressing toward the prize? This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, the fact that God can't lie and that He's promised me and He's promised you that wonderful place called heaven, how wonderful that is. You ever thought about what an anchor does? Take a boat or a ship that's in the water and the tide comes out and the tide comes in and when the tide goes out, whatever is in the water, it kind of pulls out with it. It moves everything around in the process of that. That anchor holds it steady. In the midst of all that movement, all that chaos, all that back and forth, it's held steady. It doesn't give way. It remains firm. It doesn't give in. Well, how is that? Because it has an anchor, something to hold it down, something tied to. Friend, the same is true for every Christian. What's our anchor? This hope we have. The hope of Christianity. The fact that one day we know if we live true to God, we can be in heaven. That's what holds us down, what makes us press forward in our fight. And so the encouragement today is don't go back, don't give up, don't give in. Keep pressing forward. The hope of Christianity is going to be worth it. Jesus is our hope. 
God's our hope. The hope of heaven encourages every one of us. And friend, if you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to do that today. Don't you want to be one of God's children? Don't you want to one day live with God forever? Do you want the best life, the happiest life, and the life that ultimately has heaven as its end result? Well, friend, that's the Christian life. If you're not a child of God, we want to urge you to become one. Do you really believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world? In Matthew chapter 1, it was said of Jesus, you will call His name uh, Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Jesus, He's the Savior of His people. Uh, Acts 4 verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other. No other name under heaven and given among men by which we must be saved. Do you believe that? Are you willing to make a commitment to the fact that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. If so, friend, would you do more than just believe? Would you turn from sin to God? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. It is said of the Thessalonians that they turn from idols to God to serve the true and living God. The Bible says repent and turn, and that's a perfect example of that. We leave sin behind and we turn in the direction of God to live for Him. Having repented, would you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior? The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And having made that good confession, would you obey the gospel and baptism? Here's what Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You know, Saul of Tarsus was told by the Lord, you go into the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Ananias approaches Saul, and in Acts 22, 16, here's what he says. Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins. Have you obeyed God's plan of salvation by being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2, verse 38. Friend, if you've done all that, but maybe you haven't grown, or maybe sin has pulled you back in, the good news is you can repent and turn from that and come back home to God. Our prayer and hope today is that each of us will be encouraged to go on to perfection and ultimately live in heaven with God for eternity. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.